the sacrifice will now begin. Uh, so, yeah. distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to this plenary session, tackling innovation, pa pardon me, tackling inflation through innovation and inclusion. Your presenting partner today, Kojiko Inc., is pursuing its mission of bringing people together through powerful communications and entertainment experiences. We continue to build on our unique attributes that set us apart, our unique North American broadband networks that serve 1.6 million customers in Canada and the United States with reliable plant, a strong network of radio stations, solid relationships with the communities we serve, a customer-centric mindset, and our people-focused structure. I would like to take a few moments now to comment on developments that have caught my eye recently as they relate to innovation and inclusion. Recently, the Globe and Mail ran a series of penetrating articles about the stagnation of productivity growth in Canada, as well as the gross national product per capita, which is also stagnating. It seems to me that as long as the federal government does not create an investment-friendly climate for investors to take risk in updating production equipment, for example, the situation will continue and we will not succeed. Of course, we applaud the efforts to bring us into the future with electric vehicles and the battery file. But what I'm talking about here is more mundane. I'm talking about risk taking by small, medium and not so medium enterprises. As long as we are obsessed with taxing capital gains, which has been the theme that we've been he hearing now for about a decade in this country, as long as that continues, we will not succeed. In my opinion, tax incentives should be used far more than they are to encourage investment in production facilities, in production facilities. Another subject of worry is the housing crisis. Remedies proposed to date such as the abolition of the GST and the raising of uh, lending limits by the Canadian Housing Development Corporation are a very good start. But I feel we need a deeper strategy to unlock, simplify, redirect construction capability, land use, financing structures, in particular for the low rent segment to attract investment there. Speaking of land use, and this will be of much interest to Ontarians in this room, the Montreal Chamber of Commerce has produced a study this June, a provocative study on the subject. It's come up with a series of sweeping recommendations, and here is a sampling of the ideas brought forward to encourage densification and avoid urban sprawl. Remove the minimum parking space requirement and relax height limitations for building uh, apartment buildings. Authorized multi-dwelling unit construction in single family neighborhoods. Recover land devoted to open air parking in malls for construction. Initiate financial incentives for densification and lower end dwellings. And finally, increase immigration in the building trades. These are a few of the 15 recommendations which I have admittedly shortened and simplified for the purpose of expediency. And yes, I agree, they are very challenging. The last point I would like to make is of particular significance to me. Many of you here have heard my calls for a much higher minimum wage in past years. And I still believe we need to look at policies to ensure that the wealth created by business is distributed in a more inclusive manner. To conclude, in a world of upheaval because of climate change and high inflation, these are but a few of the ideas we need to hear and debate and we are about to hear a lot more. Victor Dodich, 
Dominic Barton, we look forward to your comments, your thoughts, your perspectives, and a great discussion. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very excited to be here with Victor. I don't think he needs any introduction, but I want to point out a couple of the many things that he has done, because I think it helps inform the basis of a discussion that we'll have. As you know, he's been the CEO at CIBC for nine years. Uh, he's also the head of the Business Council, the chairman of the Business Council of Canada, and I think has a very broad lens in terms of what's happening here, and as well as the North American market um, writ large. And he was uh, just very recently, last year, I think it was the president of the International Monetary Conference, which is basically all the banks, the major banks around the world pick someone to effectively lead them over the course of the year on the issues of the day, which uh, Victor did last year. So I think we've got someone with an incredibly broad perspective, but also in, I think, leading a, a very, very significant financial institution understands how the country works. Um, now, if you have the best, play, if you want to invest in Canada, invest in a bank. I, I won't go get carried away and say invest in CIBC, but maybe a, if you have lack of, but, but I just think that there's a, because the banks represent very much what's going on. So that's just the context. And what I wanted to do with uh, your permission is just kind of start with the sort of big picture in the world and then kind of come right down to you, if you will, in this, the, the, 20, the 20 minutes. Can you stay on? It, I guess it is. I don't you can hear us? that many nice things about me ever. Oh, that's, <laughs> we're just getting started. So, so um, I want to start just with the macro context in the world. And just to be more specific, there's a lot that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are what are a couple of things that really excite you, actually, and then a couple of things that scare you or make you nervous? Well, long term things always excite me. And I'm excited to be here with you, Dominic, because what many people don't know is Dominic interviewed me in 1993 for an associate job at McKinsey when I was at Harvard Business School. And I was enamored with his way of thinking. And I said, this is the firm to join. And my life changed because of that. He did leave, and, <laughs> unfortunately. That was the, yeah. <laughs> and the reason I mention that is when you look at the world today and you think of it from a short-term perspective, there's lots of reasons to feel angst. Uh, when I think about it from a longer-term perspective, there's lots of reasons to feel good about where we're going. You know, if you think about the evolution of the economy over the last 150, 200 years, on a rolling 10-year basis, life has gotten better for almost everybody. And that's something that we shouldn't lose sight of as we think about the long term. And let's think about what's happening in that long term to change the trajectory of where we feel we may be today. So let's, but let's decouple today first. What are we dealing with? I call them the three Ds. We're dealing with debt. We're dealing with deglobalization. We're dealing with demographics. And it all varies depending on what part of the world that you're in. And it's all being exacerbated by interest rates and inflation today. So people are feeling a great deal of angst. Governments are feeling angst because their debts that have grown over time to fund their growth, particularly in some parts of the world, are accounting for more and more of their budget. You know, in Canada, back in 1989, 1990, over 30 cents of every dollar went to interest expense in the federal budget. Today, it's between eight and 10 cents. So it's a number we have to watch out for very carefully because interest expense can really eat away at not only consumers' pockets, but also government coffers and really change the allocation of where they invest in going forward. I think the risk of deglobalization is a very real risk today. And the role that you play, Dominic, uh, in your role, both as chairman of Rio Tinto, but in your connectivity around the world, it's important that we're making sure those connections stay as geopolitical tensions tend to pull us apart. I think we all know that over the long term, those, those connections matter. What countries can do for other countries, how comparative advantage plays a role. Everything you learned in first year economics in university still holds true. And we shouldn't as business leaders or whatever organizations that we do lead, let that fray. That deglobalization risk is a very real risk. And then demographics. In this part of the world, birth rates are low. We're promoting immigration. 
for a very good reason, but that's also creating some anxiety. In other parts of the world, demographic, demographics are quite robust. Are we providing enough capital and opportunity for them to prosper going forward? So when I look at the problems today, they're very real. But when I look at the solutions that are at hand, they're very real as well. How do we deal with avoiding deglobalization? How do we deal with the demographic trends in different parts of the world and make sure that prosperity is the order of the day for everyone, whether your birth rate is high or whether your birth rate is low? And how do we deal with innovation, which is something that Louis talked about early on, to drive better productivity, to drive better prosperity so that we can retire some of this debt that's been accumulated over this very unique period of 15 years where money has been mispriced and people have probably taken on too much. So it's actually a, a long term, you're quite optimistic. I am. You're optimistic. We have issues and I think that frameworks very, the, the three Ds is a, a very good way to look at that. One of the reasons I'm optimistic, and I know we'll touch on this, is technology. Technology continues to make our lives better. Healthcare better, businesses more productive, consumers more informed. That's something I want to come back to again on AI, given that Canada is one of the, the leading innovators in the world on that. I'll come yeah. back to it, but just how we... How do we commercialize that and get, and in a sense, not only reap the benefits from the productivity, but also the scaling companies? But Absolutely. I'm, but just so, so that's the world optimistic. If we think about this over a long period of time, issues that are pretty clear about what we have to deal with, but we can we keep that in mind. If you then think about Canada mm -hmm. and and where we are, and I'm thinking again in your business council chair role, also in again leading the bank. How is Canada positioned? We're talking about a resilient. Are we, what, maybe again, back to that, what are, what are a couple of things that excite you about where we are? And then a couple of things that, that really worry you about where we are. Canada is exceptionally well positioned to what I call feed and fuel the world. Uh, we are endowed. We, you know, we're always known as hewers of wood and drawers of water. But the fact of the matter is much of what Canada has today, whether it's agriculture, whether it's rare earth minerals, whether it's every form of energy possible from hydro and nuclear right through to responsibly produced non-renewable power, non-renewable energy, Canada has all of that that the world needs today. So well endowed to feed and fuel the world. The second thing is, you know, we're a country that has more free trade agreements than any other country in the world. We're a country of 38 million, 40 million people that has trade agreements to well over a billion people. So the markets are open to us. We have people that want to come to Canada. They want to build a life here because they see a world where Canada reflects the world. And I see an inclusive society that wants to give everybody an opportunity. You know, I speak personally because my father came in as a refugee in 1961. He was in a UN camp, came here through interviews, got a job, and here I am captaining a Canadian bank, uh, you know, 50 years later. Like, that can happen in Canada. And people need to know that what I did, everybody has the opportunity to do. Even if you just come with $10 from Halifax to Toronto on a train in Union Station. So we have all of that working for us. I do worry that um, we are losing our middle power status. I do worry that uh, Canada projects well, but needs to do more. So as the world is looking to energy and energy transition, I think Canada has to play a more important role in feeding that energy transition using our entire portfolio of non-renewable energy right through and including nuclear. And that latter one is going to play a more important role as well. I think that we need to have policies that drive those goods out to markets rather than wring our hands and wonder if we can get them out to markets and not really get anything done. Over the last seven years, I believe the U.S. has put in place six LNG facilities and two more coming on stream, and we're barely getting one on going, and yet we're endowed with oil and gas. Uh, we need to also promote responsible agricultural intensity to fuel the world. And we need to also modify our immigration policies so that and our own domestic policies so that immigration actually results in people wanting to stay here long term. If Canada can do those things right, get 
our, mar uh, our goods out to market, make our free tra tra trade agreements work for us. We're highly reliant on one large market to the south of us. Case in point, we're the sixth largest energy producer in the world. 91% of our energy exports go south. We need to diversify. We need to change that. So lots of work to do there to get better. And it's not, you know, the, your point about the, the wealth. And Canada is literally, some people would, the, the richest country on earth, especially on a per capita basis. But there is a criticism, too, that we're not a very ambitious country that you, in, in the sense of, if I, I remember, you know, in 1990, I think we had 19 Canadian companies that were in the one or two spot in their sector globally. Now I think there's three. Yes. Um, what is it about, is it, it's sort of, there's sort of this notion of execution, like we have all this potential, what, why, what's, I don't know, that's probably a deeper, it's sort of a two hour discussion, but, but what's, what's prevent, what's blocking that? Why are we, uh, why are we punching below our weight? Yeah. I, it's a good question. Is it something in the Canadian psyche? Is it something in the Canadian capital markets? It's probably, is it something in our lack of curiosity around innovation or our willingness to scale companies and keep them here? It's probably a combination of all of them. You know, when um, you look at the United States, which is known for its enterprising nature and its robust economy and its deep capital markets, all encapsulated in a constitution that says, it's all about life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Canada's all about peace, order, and good government. I think it probably lies somewhere in between. The truth lies somewhere in between. We need deeper capital markets in our country. We need more risk-taking. Louis talked about tax incentives. We need more capital in this country that is long-term in nature, that can fuel the growth and scale that you're talking about, Dominic. I mean, just if we take AI as an example, where I don't, I'm biased as a Canadian, but you, you hear it everywhere that, that Canada is literally you know, one of the top two or three in the world in terms of the innovation that's going on, the, the academic prowess that we have and so forth. It's in a sense, it's ours to lose, if you will, if we scale it. But a lot of these companies are, you know, the, the market is not going to be here, the capital to your point. How do we, what, what do we need to do differently, do you think, to um, to, to be is it usually against the depth of the capital market, the growth capital that we don't have? When one of the other example, yeah. You have the Singapore Tomasic, who's actually the, their leader, I think, is in the country today in Toronto, is one of his areas of focus is how do we get more growth capital in Canada? Because there's amazing companies. Why do, and we'd, we want to support that. So it's interesting, someone from outside looking at it. But what, how would we, what, any thoughts on that? Because you, you see a lot of smaller companies that grow and build. You see the system. Well, if you look at what we've been able to achieve in the early innings of AI, Edmonton, Montreal, Toronto, Waterloo, real centers of excellence, real leaders. And what we need to do is nurture and feed those leaders and scale them with that risk capital. We also need to make sure that our businesses and our diplomacy is pursuing export-oriented strategies to drive economic growth and all those free-to-trade agreements that we have in place. We don't do enough of that. We don't think of the entire ecosystem of driving that growth. We don't think of AI as a way of actually reducing inflation over time. You, you look at all the pressures that we're facing today, and I often tell policymakers, don't just rely on central banks to get inflation to a better place. Pursue policies that drive better productivity, that drive more innovation, that drive a better deflationary outcome to offset the real, very real imbalances that we have in place today. So sometimes it's tax incentives. You know, why can't we have flow through shares in the technology sector like we had in the mining sector? One of the reasons Canada's mining sector became the way it did over the years is because we were endowed. Then we created structures to allow investors to invest and put risk capital in place with the right tax incentives in place. And then the capital markets started developing around that. And to this day, our mining companies are some of the best globally, partially because of that. Yeah, and the, and the, in many senses, the center, you talk about capital markets, the advisory is in Canada for the global, for the global system. But just with the time, I'm just going to shift a bit to, to, the, to the role of the corporation. So we talked about the world, 
Canada, the role of the corporations. There's lots of discussions. Again, thinking about what you said earlier about joining the business world in the in the early '90s and where it is, the role of the corporation. What's your? How do you see that? There's a, there's a lot of debate about that. That corporations need to actually do a lot more. Uh, think in a, in a broader way. There's others who say just frankly focus on delivering the shareholder returns. Thank you very much, and we'll have others deal with it. Where where are you in that spectrum? Or- well, I, I, it's a good question. You know, as as the political divide has become more accentuated in the world, uh, the common sense middle seems to be missing. And I've always looked at leaders of businesses and nonprofits, organizations that are non-political as filling that void. We employ a lot of people. We, um, you know, we support a lot of clients and their growth ambitions. At CIBC, we talk about making your ambitions real. We have a lot of suppliers that rely on us. So we've always had to manage stakeholders. But in this world where the world is being more and more divided, I would encourage those of you who lead organizations that are non-political, that actually create economic value and drive prosperity to fill that void. It could be through your influence with policymakers, but it could be what you do in your own respective organizations. I believe business is a source for good. We go out each and every day to serve our clients, to make life better for our employees, to deliver for our shareholders, to take part of our profits and investment in our communities. That's what business needs to do. And it's becoming more important today than ever given the political divide that we've seen. Everyone's reaching for the far light, far right and far left. No one's dealing with how does Bay Street meet Main Street? How does Wall Street meet Main Street? How do we try to understand what each and every Canadian or American or wherever you may lead and live, lead to a better life? And what role does the company play in that? And I think we can play an important role. I often say to leaders, I mean, how often do you sit down with an elected official to talk to them about their policies? Or do we just get together amongst ourselves and complain? The only way to make change happen is through that real interaction. And that, so you're very much into the stakeholder, which I think also fits with your long term because they all come together in the long term. They do. You're doing. Do you get any pressure from investors to say, why, you know, why are you doing that? What, you know, you always get pressure from investors, depending on where your stock price is. Um, Look, um, I, I think most investors would recognize that when you play an important leadership role where you bank over 12 million clients in our in our world where we actually spend billions of dollars on suppliers each and every day that drives small and medium-sized business in canada they recognize that your role is not just about driving shareholder value but it's don't lose sight of that that's your primary goal but you should play a role in these other areas that's and that you encourage that yeah i think so and i think that's that's what concerns me the most about the world what we're in today is that that void in the middle, that common sense. And I think most of us feel that way. Then I'd ask you, as you go through today's discussions, what are you doing about it? Yeah. You you've you yourself have done. I don't want to come to you for a bit as a leader, because I think you also personally exemplify that on, on a whole range of different topics, diversity and inclusion, uh immigration that we right. talked about before, which I know is very passionate to you. But can we talk a bit about you as a yep. CEO? Nine years as a you know as a, as a ceo and that's a that's a the average ceo term is about five years right um and i think there's again i'm not just saying it's made a huge benefit for the continuity and uh, and sort of building things o- over time how have you thought about your if you could call it your phases of being a ceo what's wh- how, how is what's the approach that you've taken because you've you've gone through a lot over that period of time but i i yeah. know you and you think about deliberate things that you're trying to build. How do you, how do you think about that? Well, I've had the fortunate um, opportunity of being a customer service representative at our bank in the eighties uh, when I was at university on Thursdays, Fridays and Saturdays frontline. Yeah. I remember back then they, people would line up in the banking centers to deposit their check because there was no e-deposit. There was no ATM in many of the banking centers and people would shoehorn them in till 8 PM at night so they can get their checks deposited. So, what I've always walked in with in leadership is a try to understand your team, try to understand your clients before you try to understand your strategy, try to understand what's on their minds, try and flatten the hierarchical structure of your organization. Don't think that it's all about you. 
it's really all about us working together each and every day. And I know that sounds like, you know, a classic statement that a leader would make, but I truly believe that. The unsung heroes are the people who are in our banking centers, the people who are moving money from banking center to banking center, the people who are helping a client realize their hopes and dreams of buying a home or putting their kids in education or actually investing in a business for growth in the future. So I think it's really important to understand those stakeholders very, very well. I try to do that. I try and visit with clients regularly, with our team regularly, and communicate regularly. Two is I think you have to have a view of where the world is going and how you have to position your organization for success into the future. What you're really doing, and this is where the quarterly life cycle of a public company sometimes is at odds with long-term thinking, and I know you've been a big believer in long-term capitalism, how do you make sure that the big boulders are in place so that when you hang up the cleats, the company has tailwinds? And in our business, it's about having the right strategy, the right client focus, making the right technological investments, making sure your credit rating stays strong, making sure you have access to markets, making sure you generate capital so that the next generation of leaders feels that tailwind. And then, of course, it's people, right? How do you generate and nurture that next level of talent so that they can lead into the future? You know, I meet some of the kids that spend summer co-op internships with us, and I tell each of them, any one of you could be in my role 20 years from now. Any one of you, if you want to. And I tell the young folks, the Gen Zs of the world, that too often they have the wandering uh, career eye of what's next for me. And sometimes it's really good to stick with something for some time, period of time to become, re become really, really good at it because large organizations are complex and they do require a level of specific knowledge that comes with leadership. So it sounds like you're, you've been, you keep yourself very grounded. You yeah. remember what it was like when you were uh, in that center yeah. as, a, as a student. But I know we're running out of time. One last question, which is, you know, the role of the CEO is 24 seven. It's just your, it's not about managing your time. It's managing your energy. Mm -hmm. Any hacks that you can give us and how, cause you seem in very good shape. You're balanced. You have a great family. I'm sure you've got some psychosis that I'm not aware of. We'll find <laughs> out, but, but it's pretty, so how, what are the, what are the ways in which you have been able to get the balance to keep, keep the energy, uh, to keep the focus, to have, you know, to, to ha have a whole life, if you will. Any, ha any tips? Uh, there is a philosophy I have around really focusing on strength when times are tough and really focusing on humility when things are really good. So you never get your own ego out of check. You keep, you keep well grounded. The second thing I do is I try to exercise every day. This morning I rode 4,100 meters from like, I don't know, it was like 6.20 a.m. to 6.40 a.m. On you. Yeah, I have a lot of devices yeah, yeah. on me here, but you know, part of it is staying healthy, right? And I, I just, someone gave me a book um, that's it's Outlive. We've been reading that book. Anybody read that book? Have you read it? It's all about like, how do you do things in your life to prevent the four horsemen of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's and dementia? And how do you lead a life that you know, is focused on exercise, focused on your wellness, focused on your emotional well-being and hanging out with people you really like to hang out with. I mean, he changed my life. <laughs> so when he called me, he said, can you do this? I didn't hesitate for a second. Of course I can do it. That's important. And as we go through our life, you realize that these relationships are the things that help you live a real long life. And I'm hoping that's the case for both of us, Dominic. Well, thank you. I think that's a wonderful way to end our conversation. So thank, thank you, you, Victor. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Victor and Dominic, um, I've been asked to say a few words to thank you. Uh, this has been very in inspiring. You started from a high level and gradually focused down uh, in the spirit of enthusiasm and positivism. So that, that was very good. Your 3D lens to uh, bring us to the point where we have to find a way for riches to be um, spread more or less fairly across um, across various countries is a, hel a very helpful way to think about it. Um, you stressed the importance of the free trade agreements we have. 
and reference was made to the need for Canada to have ambition, to have more ambition, and I couldn't share that more. Um, we're punching below our weight, yes. Are we, are we really exporting as much as we could? That's a very good question. Then the question was, what do we need? Well, as always, government policies set the tone and then the market gets into movement and fills, fills the void. You spoke a lot about the role of the corporation uh, and the importance of it filling the middle position, the common sense position. I thought that was quite inspiring in this very polarized world. And finally, you stress the importance of a balanced life and a stakeholder focus. So thank you very much, Victor and Dominic. This has been very inspiring.